Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today on The Microscopists, I catch up with Harold Hess of the HHMI Janelia Research Campus, and we talk about building electron microscopes. From that, you really get a, you know, an empowering sense that, you know, you can build these things. You know, it's not something that you're stuck buying. And believe it or not, tennis matches with Eric Betsy. I think I run more, but he just gets the ball back and just wins every time <laughs> without exerting too much energy. What his mother thought about his first palm images. I shared this photo you know, with my, with my mother and, you know, and she took a look of, look at it. She was a medical technician, sort of by, by training and, you know, in Southern German language, you know, the Swabian, she said, this is a piece of which translated means, uh, she wasn't very impressed by it. And why following your scientific passions should be supported. The world really thrives by having different approaches, different ecosystems, uh, and trying to unify it too much is is good. I mean, you really need the sort of the diversity of approaches. All in this episode of the Microscopists. Hi and welcome to this new episode of The Microscopist and today I'm joined by Harold Hess from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Janelia Research Campus. How are you Harold? I'm oh, doing great, that's a campus right back there. <laughs> and, and, and it is a beautiful, it looks beautifully sunny out there at the moment as well. It, it is, beautiful day here, perfect summer, one of the perfect summer days. How did you, oh, oh no, this is going to be a long story isn't it, so I'm going to break this down. I was going to say how did you end up at uh, Janelia Research Campus because it is an inspiring place but like, you know, let's take you right back I'm going to ask why science what got you into science to start with oh gosh um yeah I'd say for me it's been a really long long path and not straightforward to ending up in a you know beautiful place like this um I can say I've been interested in science certainly since elementary middle school um I could say I started out very curious, like, you know, what is the biggest thing in the world? Typically what you'd ask as a young boy, you know, in astronomy, looking at the stars, galaxies was there. And after a while, sort of went in the other direction. Okay, what's, what's the smallest? And then you sort of keep going and you learn about atoms and, uh, you know, a little bit later, protons and electrons. And you think, okay, this is what, what's the fundamental stuff that we're, you know, made out of and later on as i got into um, high school you know it was allowed to have a little bit of independent freedom i sort of grew up in a small town in the yep. midwest and you know i learned about there were these, these things called science fairs and i sort of just got into building various projects for that and along with model airplanes and other stuff i just sort of loved going down to the basement and start putting stuff together. So and, what, what sort of stuff were you putting together? Um, it was all over the place. It was inspired by, you know, Scientific American use a long time ago, had some articles about doing your own experiments. So, you know, just to see atomic particles like electrons, you know, built actually a, a little cloud chamber uh, you know, sent my parents off to truck stops to get dry ice and build it out of a inverted pot and, you know, my gosh, get a little bit of radium source somewhere from the local watchmaker, so, uh, from radium dials, and then you can yeah. see little particle tracks. So that was like, okay, that was a warm up project. And so this was in your parents' basement, did you say? Parents, wherever there was space. So that was starting. And it sort of just kept going. There was just 
all these cool instruments that particle physicists were making just to see like what's the universe made out of you know that's spark chambers bubble chambers particle accelerators scintillation counters so i ended up again like scientific american had these uh, articles on how to build your own particle accelerator and followed that to a certain extent you know you need vacuum pumps so being in a small town you just go to the junkyard get a refrigerator cut out the compressor uh, fix it up a little bit inside saw it open which takes a couple days to saw with a hacksaw and you know put things together gradually and uh, you know, at that time as a youngster, you could buy mercury diffusion pumps and things like that. And, <laughs> and just that, that's a lot of physics and engineering put together. So I guess it was a physics path. It was very physics. Yeah, because I just really loved the idea of like, what, what are the fundamental constituents of what matter is? Okay. And so and also being in you know an environment where you could just make this a project uh, you know in a small town and putting things together you know i think it gave me a, a very early sense of experimental physics you know that many many people don't have so as a schoolboy you 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 got into physics mm -hmm. where did you see at that at that age where did you see your career going what did you want to be what did you aspire to be when you when you, when you grew up and got a job um i'm not i was very scientifically inclined i remember taking one of these career tests in high school where they try to assess your skills and things like that and they said i should become a watchmaker um i didn't follow that path <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, but i did like tinkering with the with the things a lot um so i i think from there it's you know, it might have been engineering or science. I, at that point, I wasn't sure exactly. Uh, but, you know, but at some point then I, you know, went on to the University of Chicago and which was I don't know, quite formative for me too. And how, uh, how so as I, I don't know where you were brought up. So how big a change was moving to Chicago? Oh, it was traumatic. Uh, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest. Yep. You know, just a few thousand population. So I was a little bit the nerd odd person there. And, you know, I had a chance to go take a little more engineering, a little bit more committed direction originally, but I thought, okay, let's keep options open. And I thought, okay, let's get a little bit more liberal arts, see everything, the sciences, the engineerings and all that to not commit too quickly to a path. Uh, ended up at the University of Chicago there. And uh, just tried to catch on again you know coming up from the midwest small town then you go to a big city place where they really have uh you know fluorescent lights and all these crazy things it was uh, a bit of a change being away from home is a bit of a change too but struggled for a while but i think managed to get into the groove after about a year or two and, and you, know, you just said before you know you were, you were a bit of a small town couple of thousand you were the the nerd, I think, was a phrase you used. Oh, definitely. You yes. make things. Suddenly, you're going to be in a, a cohort of many like-minded people as well. Maybe not all, but some of them would have been very similar. What was that like, finding people that were similarly passionate about physics? Oh, and yeah, physics? that was, I mean, for me, it was scary. I mean, I was, I was shy to approach any of these professors. I mean, they were like way up there. And what am I, just, just another person entering this world? Uh, but there was one counselor who recommended that you know i should go and you know talk to some of the professors you know get involved in some of their lab research and uh and so then i sort of took that maybe maybe as a direction to go into uh, but certainly start out with you know a heavy physics load that was average nothing special yeah uh, initially um i did really get into the lab side of doing the physics uh, problems and uh and some of the professors i found uh you know could be just so modest i mean nobel prize winner level like jim cronin who uh you know found you know parity violation uh you know he was teaching solid state physics which was new to him and he was approaching it like another student 
and just beginning to feel like a common interest at that point, I think was really inspiring as opposed to a, a very high top down yeah. kind of approach. So, so actually, that is a good question. Who, who has inspired you like, throughout your career? Has there been any single person or? I, I think a lot of people have been just critically enabling. Uh, I think I almost had my own little sense of direction. Um, but, you know, just countless people were enabling, opening up the world in this direction, getting past barriers, uh, or, or just showing, you know, showing new areas. Um, I, I, so at the University of Chicago, um, I eventually uh, decided to do a little bit of extra lab work with uh, Elmar Seitler. And at the time, the University of Chicago was like a, a really big place for electron microscopy. You know, the guy who invented the diamond knife was there earlier. Um, there was, uh, yeah, Elmer Zeitler and uh, yeah, a number of others. We we're just sort of developing various forms of microscopy, you know, in the uh, scanning microscopes too at the time. Albert, microscopy Albert started Krug. quite early. Yeah. yeah, microscopy started very early, but then there was another form of microscopy, scanning electron microscopy. Uh, it was also developed early, but maybe not quite as refined as in the mainstream. And the University of Chicago under Albert Crew was sort of had a, uh, a group of people um, or like-minded uh, scientists there developing it, pushing it to its limits. And there was early work, people saying, ex-particle physicists saying, oh, we can maybe make proton microscopes, treating protons down, um, trying to get the limit of, you know, other kinds of microscopes, certainly the electron or scanning microscopes was, uh, you know, was a topic. I'd say, um, you yeah, know, maybe uh, one thing that sort of in inspired me was uh, actually attending a uh, a colloquium. I remember sitting all the way at the back, and I think it was Albert Crew at the time, and he was describing some of the electron microscope work that they were doing at the time. And this is one where they were refined it, trying to get what's the ultimate resolution, really building the thing from first principles, and they were able at that point to see single atoms. And that was really, you know, something where I said, okay, wow. You know, before single atoms had been seen in something called yep. a field, field ion microscope. So you just see atoms on the tip of a tungsten tip. Yep. But these were now pictures um, of different heavy metal atoms. I think thorium, uranium, indium. And, and you could just sort of see them just literally sitting there on a piece of graphite. And they would just light up. And, you know, and this was like an exciting time. Those, yes. I, I might, are these That's pictures, so, so these are actually some of those pictures from that time? That's, these were like very original, to me, like this is like, this is groundbreaking. The scale bar on the images that I've got in the background, for those listening, the scale bar is one nanometer, which is, which is tiny. And the particles we're looking at are less than a nanometer? Oh, yeah. I mean, these are individual heavy yeah. metals. I'm not sure if this was indium or uranium or, you know, they were able to look at various atoms in even to a certain extent from spectral loss, trying to get their identity directly too. So this, I mean, to me, this was just amazing. And on top of that, you'll notice there's like a time scale. Yep. They weren't sitting there, you know, they would move. So these were like movies of these guys uh, moving around in time. So, so the, the scale bar here again for those zero seconds, 15 seconds, 45 seconds. Right. And this is under vacuum. This obviously. is under vacuum. It's, and the movie. Like, yeah. It's sort of idealized. I mean, this is mid '70s, so making movies was a little bit of a different enterprise back then than it would be today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and building scanning electronics and things like that. This is almost before computers were really there. It's all very analog based. Uh, so there's. So this is yes. different again, though, isn't it? What, so. Yes. So this is after I saw those movie pictures, I thought, OK, I really need to get a little bit more involved with this. And this is a one million volt electron micros uh, microscope. I remember Absolutely. my first visit with uh, you know, Professor Zeitler at the time, I mentioned building a half million volt particle accelerator. And I guess he took that as an endorsement and signed me up. So I was lucky enough to participate in this. So it's, this is a big sewer tank uh, uh, filled with uh, sulfur hexafluorine for high pressures to act as an insulator. And inside was a one million volt structure. And it was a, it was a major construction project because everything is built on its own. I, how, um, how tall is this? Just, just to give an impression, because this is actually a much taller image than I, than I have. Uh, yeah, I think eye level is maybe about even with that large horizontal bar that you see in there. Just here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or if, if you look yeah. over at the side, you can see what looks like a typical lab cabinet. Like, oh, um, yes, 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 yeah, yes. And a lab bench. Yeah. So it's taller than a human, but eye level is maybe at the bottom of, uh, yeah, some, wow. somewhere in that, that range. It's big. I mean, we look at today's electron microscopes, the big cryo electron microscopes. Yeah. Actually, this dwarfs it for some of those. Yeah. Well, this was at the very beginning of really exploring scanning electron microscopy. I mean, there was work on field emission in those early days. It was sort of shared with Hitachi a long time ago. And uh, I remember being part of, and the beauty of it was part of just the groundwork of everything, you know, the electronics, you build a circuit board, resistors, amplifiers to do rotational, rotate the scan, you know, you'd have special rotary trim pots. Uh, again, computers weren't an option back then. You know, there are other ways of trying to record what's going on with the scans. And I, I know, so, but still from that, you really get a, you know, an empowering sense that, you know, you can build these things. You know, it's not something that you're stuck buying or constrained about. Was that after your PhD? Um, actually, no, that was my undergraduate. <laughs> that was so, your undergraduate, wow. That was under, and this was a very forward looking microscope. And unfortunately at the time, it wasn't clear what biology it was going to be able to impact. And so it never got fully funded on it, which but, but, is a, a shame because it was just so forward looking. So I left Chicago and the project stopped unfortunately but it was a you know I, I think i feel so lucky to have been part of that but effort that's quite interesting was your target was your ambition to to use this for biology then rather than for material science um at the moment i think i just loved the technology i didn't have any agenda i think i always had a interest in okay what are interesting physics style problems uh there was intense interest in biology at the time with with this okay um you know sequence dna can you label yeah. each um base with a certain heavy metal but this motion that you saw earlier in the picture that's something that was going to haunt the field forever and even today you know the electron induced motion um but that time that project unfortunately stopped my professor titler went off to berlin you know, I went off to go in yet another direction of trying to go. Initially, I thought, okay, particle physics again, you know, let's get to the fundamental nature of matter and work at Fermilab for, for a little while from first year there. But I was a little disturbed by the fact that these particle physics efforts are just huge team efforts. And they're, they're fun. You're part of something really, really big. But I really like the sense of doing something a little bit more tabletop, a little bit more intimate, you know, where you can sort of see the beginnings and the ends and everything. You can walk around your experiment, you know, in, in, instead of being a, you know, a component of it. 
So I've got to ask, you said you had lots of uh, good guidance, yeah, yeah, lots of good tutors that you, you, you looked up to. How good was a career advice that they gave you over those years? Um, I don't know. I think I probably ignored everything. Uh, I sort of was just driven by my interests and my passion. Um, I, I know, for example, in, uh, yeah, in Princeton, I just wanted to do, you know, again, I mentioned sort of a small experiment. And then I thought, okay, low temperature physics. That was sort of like the kind of experiments that, that one could do you know, on, on a small scale and, you know, and had a good time at that. Um, I think the guidance normally at that time was uh, not explicit. It was like, okay, here's an option. You can go either up the postdoc track and go into the academic career, or one can sort of go into a more engineering path, uh, still get involved with the semiconductor industry you know, join IBM or other places like that, which were super big. And I think I was exploring both, really not really biased toward one or the other, rather rather neutral and rather accommodating of, uh, you know, of what's available. I remember, um, you know, when I was finishing, uh, you know, my postdoc, then of course the question comes up, where, where do I go? So I, I really applied to both, uh, both areas. Oh, where did you end up going? Um, actually, I ended up going to uh, MIT to uh, I mean, so what I thought was like one of the most amazing problems that one could sort of go after. Um, I was working as a PhD. I was working at low temperature property of glasses. And I thought, oh, glasses are messy. They're disorganized. And the project they had at MIT was, I thought, the ultimate physics Thing, uh, the ultimate thing in simplicity. It was like the hydrogen atom, just it by itself. And they had a great plan uh, at the time to turn super cold hydrogen atom gas into something called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And, and, and for me, this was amazing. I mean, like from physics, you learn that there are like about four states of matter, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's earth, water, air, and fire. And this Bose condensate, this is supposed to be like the absolute new state of matter. You know, this is the fifth state of matter. So I felt like, wow, I'm going to be part of this. And so I got there and they had a scheme, you know, again, tech heavy. You work on this special dilution refrigerator and there was a scheme where you just fill it up with this hydrogen gas, you push a piston up and you squeeze it tighter and then poof, it's supposed to turn into um, a Bose-Einstein condensate. But really what happened, it just exploded and burned like crazy. Uh, explosive research. Explosive, yeah. Yeah, hydrogen atoms love to combine to make molecular hydrogen. Which I guess so is a key part of that concept. Yeah, well, so what happened, that was actually when it exploded, you know, my little dreams that this could be part of a future career sort of evaporated with it. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in the stuff, the hydrogen burns on the walls. If you squeeze it too much, it burns in, in the gas. And, you know, and they said, oh, write it up as a paper. But, you know, like, okay, it's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not fully, um, you know, solves the problem. And I remember, being pretty depressed by it and sort of going home and then started thinking about the hyperfine energy levels of the hydrogen and magnetic bottles and, <clears throat> and how to cool it. And then just at home, largely in isolation, I wasn't going to conferences or anything like that. And I think that was actually a virtue. I, I came up with this little idea that you just had in the background a second ago uh, of this evaporative cooling. So you can have a gas have it in a magnetic bottle, and if high energy atoms get out of the <laughs> get out of that deep trap, they take away a lot of energy, and then the rest of the stuff in the middle gets colder and colder. You could write an equation for that, and find that it's an amazingly powerful cool uh, to, cooling tool to work. And you know, at that time, I was ecstatic again. You know, it's 
things go in fluctuations, you know, from ecstasy to depression and uh, back and forth. So actually, just dwelling on that point, uh, mm -hmm. you say you've had highs and lows. How low are the lows? How high are the highs? Super. Super. Yeah. Um, how do you cope with both extremes? Because actually extreme high can be equally risky as extreme lows. Yeah. Um, I think this one was a high, but it was a little bit of a self-contained uh, one. I felt like I was in, you know, owned the secret of the universe, but, you know, couldn't go further on it or execute. And then finally I realized, okay, maybe time to open up. Maybe other people know more and, uh, you know, mention it eventually to my advisor, you know, a few months later and, you know, and they sort of developed the idea and then, uh, and actually one very interesting thing, uh, my advisor's uh, father-in-law is, was John Bardeen and he's a double Nobel laureate who invented the transistor and understood superconductivity. And so he invited me to just sit down with him and I explained this thing. And then just, he just asked one little question, like, how do you make the high energy atoms that evaporatively cool? And that was like so key and so to the heart of the problem. You know, and it gets into scattering cross sections and physics. And then he sort of from the high, you go all the way back down to the low. And it's only when you're at the bottom that you fight to build yourself back up again. And then you think, okay, how can you get around this dilemma? You obsess out, out. and then I figured out some scheme to evaporate and compress and combine things and eventually made what was a usable technique to go forward. Now, one, one thing, you know, you're asking about the lows. Um, <clears throat> A little bit after this, I decided I sort of need to move on from you know this area. Um, it was a small part of the Science Foundation budget, so there wasn't like a second budget available for me to start off doing this at some other university. So basically, I got lucky enough to be accepted at Bell Laboratories, but at the same time, I felt like, okay, I have to say goodbye to that field. So I, I think what was, that was super painful, you know, because I sort of developed something, committed to it, put my heart into it as much as you ever could. And then, and could sort of participate a little bit at the tail end of it, but now had to go off, you know, in a place with super smart people, all with established careers and try to find a new niche from nothing. And I couldn't really, you know, go from what I had in the past. And that's, so, that's a tough ask to, I guess, be very specialist, very expert in one area, and then I guess change and become expert in another area. Which it's a lot of background to to pick up, and yeah, it's a daunting challenge, I guess. Yeah, and and to know that whatever you go into is the right thing too, you know, because you want to make sure it uh, you know works out in in, in the future. Um, so. That was very tough. I mean, going in a place with high standards. I think I was lucky on many of the, in, in these cases to have other people around with very high standards. And then you have to say, okay, I got to meet this thing. I and mean, it was, like I said earlier, it was very, very demanding, very soul searching. I put literally my whole life into that just to get a toehold on being a scientist and not sort of slipping down and, and managed to sort of switch directions. But I built on my background. I had low temperature uh, experimental no. fingers, you know, that I could sort of build on from that. And at the time, then I sort of went in, I was trying to think what's, what's new. And at the time, scan probe microscopy was just coming on. And also I knew I had a background in low temperature uh, experimental techniques and I said okay let's just put those two together and I was thinking I go to Bell Labs they don't do atoms but they do electrons at a place like that so let's do evaporative cooling of electrons so that was my first you know I still had evaporation on my mind and couldn't get it off so 
But anyway, so I was evaporating electrons off of a tip into a material and then just built a little bit of a experimental infrastructure where I, I started just to explore different kinds of uh, physical phenomena, you know, that you can actually look at using, you know, using these probes. So at that point, you could say I, I sort of returned to microscopy, but this is a very physicist sort of microscopy using these, uh, you know, these probe instruments, yeah. you know, that can go in and, you know, and in the end, I sort of caught on and managed to sort of define my own little space, my own little field. I always think that should be a goal of people, you know, to what extent it's, it's getting harder and harder to do that. But to say, can you sort of open up a little field here or there as, as a measure of success? And that's sort of what they expected at Bell Labs. You know, it was, you're it's literally a one person in a lab. If you're lucky, you got a, uh, technician and if you're even luckier you might have one postdoc to help you out on things um, but you really learn then to rely on other people in terms of collaborations you know some people you know they might know what a laser is so you say hey you know what about this and then within hours you can get together with another collaborator and you know and reconfigure labs in different ways to do different kinds of uh, experiments just using, you know, their expertise. So this image that you sent me is yes. really pretty, by the way, and I, I can see this being wall art. <laughs> so <especially laughs> them so the, if I'm right, when you, you, you kindly sent through some of these pictures, and this one is some of the images from the scanning probe microscope from the Bell Labs, I think. Yes, that's correct. So like, I was always after seeing the Chicago work of seeing individual atoms, I thought, okay, I got to see individual something. And so the one with the colorful blue uh, hexagonal arrangement, uh, you know, about the size of those three spots, uh, that's about the size of a nuclear pore, you know, a little over 100 uh, nanometers. And each spot is one magnetic flux quanta, you know, like one unit of magnetic flux. And there's like, and you can visualize these things. I was sort of like uh, lucky to be the first person that could visualize these things with a scanning uh, tunneling microscope. And, uh, but they were like super experiments. You know, you'd spend months putting together the apparatus. It would fail, you would persist, you know, and you would keep going and eventually get it, you know, eventually get a picture like that. How exciting is it? when you see a when you see that image and, it's, and, and you see it come come in front of you how excited do you get at that point uh well at this point it's a transition you're coming from a low <laughs> from just feeling totally incompetent to you know the other end it's it's uh you know it's satisfying i, I wouldn't say get overly excited because that wears off pretty quickly and then you worry about the next thing uh, but you know it was satisfying to be there see this thing, this is a very curious electron structure, uh, you know, you know, for the first time. And then you think, okay, where can this continue? What can be next? And, and this ended up being a little bit of a, it works on this sample under these special, you know, sub one Kelvin conditions. And uh, so I thought, okay, let's try some more scan probes. And I imaged those with, a teeny little magnetic sensor. Uh, the picture that's right behind you in the middle, that's trying to use a single electron transistor which scans a surface. So I'm seeing fields and those are like individual atoms charged up with either plus one electron or the dark spots or minus. And so, so you can actually see, you know, electric fields from a, a one electron sensitivity. Uh, and there I was collaborating with the person at Bell Labs who invented the single electron transistor. And we just said, can we make one of these on the end of a little needle and use this as a microscope? And we said, sure, we got together. And about a year and a half later, that picture came out. Um, it, it's, the one on, it, it's strange, but, but the image there is very much like a single molecule image as well. Uh, yeah, very much. The early ones. So these, that image from myself, 
that my okay. PhD thesis was full of images like that, but from a microscope, a, a light microscope. And a light microscope. So yeah. similar. Similar, yeah. So, so similar. About, about pretty much the same. They look <laughs> doctor intensity on a grainy background. Yeah, yeah. You like to play with color scales, which is always cool. <laughs> and, and red and black is always sort of a very, you know, powerful color scale that people like to use. The the picture on the other side, uh, yeah, that one. Yeah, that was, um, you know, at Bell Labs, I met, you know, a colleague, Eric Betzik, uh, like who you, I guess, interviewed yeah. earlier. And he was just taking pictures of single molecules at the time. Yeah, you know, and we became good friends. We played tennis at, you know, at sunrise almost every morning when we were at uh, Bell Labs. You know. How early sunrise? Where Bell Labs? Uh, we'd be actually pretty competitive. You know, who was the first one in to Bell Labs? Who works the hardest? Okay. And, you know, and we'd be often in at the lab before it even got light. You know, and if I saw his car, you know, in the parking lot before mine, I would just sort of touch the hood to see how warm it is, you know, get a sense of how many minutes he beat me by. <laughs> You're not at all competitive then, Harold. No. Oh yes, yeah. It's good competitive, not bad competitive. So who is a better tennis player? Um, I think I run more, but he just gets the ball back and just wins every time oh. <laughs> without exerting too much energy. <laughs> it's, or if I play ping pong with him, you know, he'll just sort of sit down and yawn and read a book in the same time, play ping pong, and I'm running back and forth on the table and. <laughs> You need to watch his tactics and then play against them. Yes. <laughs> you still play tennis with Eric? Um, that's sort of, he left to go to Berkeley. So, you know, on the occasions that he's here, you know, we try to find time for that. You know, but I do miss it. I mean, it's sort of like a, a good time to unwind, you know, put things back in perspective. And, and more, the, uh, more the tennis than the table tennis? Yeah, probably more than yeah, more real tennis than the the table tennis. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Ah, speaking yeah. so look, I, I guess on grass, on hard court, on. Um, usually it's whatever's available, you know, on asphalt with grass growing in all the cracks. You know, it's what whatever works. <laughs> you know, we're not too picky. <laughs> that sounds familiar as well. <laughs> but or you know, swatting bugs while you're swatting tennis balls. Um, it all. Yeah, all works out well. So, so I was so just going to say that, yeah, oh, sorry. So that's where you met Eric to start yes. with. Yes, yes. You, know, you then formed quite a formidable team Go, going yeah. forward. Is that fair to say a team? Because you, you were both independent of each other. Oh, yeah. But worked extremely closely together. How similar How, how similar were your personalities? Um, I think we're both very intense scientists and physicists i think we're just highly driven you know what's what really needs to be answered i think we have a a lot in common in terms of the world view of what matters what doesn't matters um technology we'd be very fluent you know talking to each other about this or that issue he was working on single molecules and i was doing low temperature bizarre things you know, I thought, okay, my stuff seeing a single electron is smaller and better than him seeing a molecule, but really seeing a molecule is actually a little bit more important than seeing a single electron in the end. So, um, but we did at the end, largely we're like a parallel effort. And uh, at the end, we did uh, collaborate on one, one experiment. And that was that last picture, which you had up there just to the right of your face, which looked like lots of little rings. You know, he knew how to make, yeah, yeah. That, exactly that one. Yeah, he knew how to make these special near field tips. I could make a low temperature environment. We brought in another person, Tim Harris, who knew what a laser was. And, you know, and within a few weeks, that was sort of like the magic of having independent collaboration teams. We just sort of put everything together and, we're able to see like individual luminescent centers in uh, you know in a semiconductor and so so it was important that that teamwork you know 
Bell Labs encourage that sort of you're a lab to yourself and insulation, but actually working as a team and bringing in collaborators was was obviously really important. Super and important. I presume, well, obviously you know at Genelia, but you didn't go straight to Genelia from Bell Labs. Um, no, Bell Labs was undergoing a little bit of a, you know, soul searching at the time. And the message coming in from the very top was, well, you guys are great physicists, scientists, and you publish. Uh, can you guys do something real to help the bottom line? AT&T wasn't a monopoly anymore. Yeah. It was becoming much more competitive. And, you know, both the telecommunications technology needed help to stay abreast on this competition. And uh, at the time, for example, I think uh, even uh, AT&T bought up NCR, which stands for National Cash Register Company. So they make, you know, checkout tools and machines, you know, for, you know, the whole retail industry. And then sort of ended up using and I was very sensitive to this. Instead of just sort of running off to the academic world, I thought, oh, uh, here's a new challenge. And, you know, and try to understand, okay, what's, you know, where, where can we go with this? And, you know, so we did some trips to NCR and they described in a grocery store, you know, on the checkout, most things are barcoded, which is great, yep. but vegetables and fruit aren't. And so we're supposed to be good scientists. How can we identify it? You know, can we go in there, you know, either smell the fruit or identify shape or things like that? And, and so at some point, then we just got um, a few bags of groceries and brought them in. And we had a really nice spectrometer set up for um, doing all the near field microscopy. And we repurposed it to look at, uh, you can see right there, uh, looking at pears and Granny Smith apples, and then trying to do what was probably very early machine learning on how can you sort of separate out one from the other. So was your ambition at this stage to have a spectr <laughs> spectrometer <laughs> on every checkout to know if it's a, which type of apple to, to pay for it? Right, right, exactly. That was the goal. That is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked partially. I mean, I think other people were coming into our lab at the time and wanted to learn about how we're doing near field of quantum wells. And, and then somebody else in the background was, you know, pulling an apple out of the fruit and attaching to the spectrometer and saying, OK, let's get the spectra of the uh, Macintosh apple now you know, recorded, good, next. <laughs> I, I say nuts, I either, nuts. Either, either nuts or still ahead of its time, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> because well, who knows what the future holds? <laughs> I'd say, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so after that, you went into industry, I guess that was semi-industry, but very academic still in, in the Bell Labs. But then you went into industry, is that right, with phase metrics? Phase metrics, yeah. This whole tail end experience from Bell Labs, it sort of really said there's something else going on. You know, we need, really need to learn where is technology or science useful. And I really took that to heart. And I thought, well, Bell Labs, they aren't really instrument builders. You know, it's a telecommunication company. And on top of that, just sort of watching what was happening in the uh, Silicon Valley. I was thinking there's there's a, another paradigm here. Doing microscopy, I was trying to understand, okay, I can look at the nanometer scale, which is great, but I look at it very slowly. This other world, the semiconductors, they're looking at massive numbers, millions of transistors, you know, thousands of, uh, you know, thousands, it's, it's, it's an understatement, billions of, uh, you know, bits, or, you know, it was, I just felt that there's, something important in the massive numbers that was missing from this very slow imaging kind of stuff that I was doing in a more academic context. And I thought, well, and besides a lot of people were leaving Bell Labs bound for these 
little companies which are all poised to be the next Hewlett Packard or the next Bell Labs of the world. So I left, you know, I joined this little company that you mentioned, Phase Metrics. You know, I remember walking in the door that morning and the receptionist said, oh, so you're the new scientist they hired. Uh, welcome. We just laid off a hundred people yesterday. Oh, and um, and I said, okay, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> and so you know, while the rats were leaving the ship, you know, I've walked on work, walked on board, <laughs> and and ever since I joined, it more or less kept going down. Um, but it was a the industry to me seemed like the perfect embodiment of sort of what I wanted to learn. This is a hard disk drive industry. And I really wanted to see, you know, can we characterize, like I said earlier, you know, the, the billions of information. Can you make scanning equipment that scans cheap, fast, high throughput, very different than an academic paradigm. And, uh, and I was just sort of committed you know, blindsided a little bit. And I just sort of went ahead with that, you know, made multi-phase interferometric uh, a structure. You know, they measure heights of the reed head. They're measuring disc quality. Are there defects? You know, can you spin through a disc, find all the defects, reject good or bad? And had the really cool technology. And that, what you see there is a multi-phase interferometer. Right now it's on the semiconductor conductor wafer there to, to see how well it applies for that, you know, the little arm that sticks right over your head is based on fiber optics, telecommunication technology, and it has nanometer sensitivity, can map these things, you know, within a minute. And it was, I think by all scientific standards, a success, but basically it was a big failure. So what happened at the end? Um, I was a little naive. I didn't fully understand one key word, um, customer. <laughs> um, and I, it was sort of like evident on the first day that I joined, you know, the customers for these kind of instruments, um, you know, they're hard disk manufacturers. Um, they were basically broke, they had no money. And so the last thing that they wanted to do was have some microscope-like thing, which is gonna reject a bunch of disks and make for lower throughput. <laughs> you know, plus it costs extra too. Yeah. And so I was, I think the experience there really, you know, really drilled into me sort of the, the importance of the, you know, of the word customer and having microscopes or techniques that are relevant. And then after this phase metrics experience, I was fired, but sort of got rehired at KLA 10 core, which is a semiconductor. Uh, and they had a very similar big challenge there. And we ended up playing with some other uh, colleagues on some DARPA grants doing high throughput imaging or writing and got some very nice funding for some pretty innovative lithography stuff. Um, but after a while, you know, that didn't quite feel like it was the right direction either. And uh, at the what time, Eric, that point? Uh, well, Eric Betzik had also gone through a, a similar cycle, you know, trying to save the American auto industry from other destruction, and he didn't quite save it. <laughs> and was like, was sort of unemployed also. And Wait, so, you Eric, left, so you left that job? Yeah, so I left it, I resigned. I mean, he was encouraging me. He said, you know, jump. And I said, then what? And then he sort of quoted Ray Bradbury and said, build your wings on the way down. Oh, oh I like that because yeah. he sent this picture actually. So oh yeah, that, that's, that's Eric. And there I've sort of found something that, you know, sort of described, you know, this was a, some welded up beetle with wings on it. Wings, yeah. Um, which was, I think, obviously on the way down. This is a picture that we took when we were in Tallahassee, Florida. And there we're both trying to look, we're trying to find, you know, where are the opportunities, where's, where's some new science? 
and uh, through a colleague, we ended up uh, at the Magnet Lab, which is in Tallahassee, Florida. And there, there was a, a rather interesting self-made man, a uh, person, uh, uh, Mike Davidson, and he had his own biology laboratory. And he had just written a paper with Jennifer Lippincart Schwartz about optical highlighters. And so within his lab, he didn't really write papers in the academic sense, but he hosted a website, had a big library of fluorophores, and it was like the go-to place for biologists to sort of get the latest of the GFPs or other things uh, which were there. Just, just, just pausing one second though. So Eric has left his job and is unemployed. Yes. And he then encouraged you to leave your job and become unemployed. Yes. And you did. That's a and hugely I, brave move. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you, the day I finished my last day at, uh, at the company, it was, I remember coming off of the plane, going back home, and it was like this huge weight was gone. You know, the sky was blue. You know, you could hear the birds tweeting again. You know, smell the flowers. It was like, okay, um, there's this whole focus or din was just sort of removed. Uh, but now there's, of course, utter fear, like what to do next. <laughs> Which was my next question. Are you not scared witless at this stage? Uh, yes, uh, we both were. Uh, and, and I think that was part of the magic of it, too. You know, when you don't have anything else to fall back on, you're forced to be creative or forced to do new things. And then we explored like what you see, we're both trying to build our ways, wings on the way down, and we ended up in Tallahassee there. And, uh, you know, and got lucky, actually. I mean, there's uh, lucky to meet the right people and lucky also to have eyes open and be aware. And we learned then of these blinking floor fours and, you know, things moved forward pretty pretty quickly from there. So did, so, so I, I, I... This picture was also on Eric's recording. This is right. your lounge, correct? Yes, my living room in La Jolla. That's right. And were you unemployed when you made this? Oh, definitely, yeah. So that yeah, that yeah. looks rather expensive as well. Yeah, this is a. I basically when I left Bell Labs, uh, I was able to sort of take uh, my lab with. It went to Phase Metrics. And then when phase metrics, uh, you know, found a lot of this equipment, not that useful, they sold it to me for a dollar. And then I set some of these leftover toys up and you're seeing there is the first palm microscope that we're just beginning to try out. I think off to the side of the picture, I think Eric is sitting in the couch, but he's not visible right there in this picture. But it was, it was great. I mean, the ability uh, to just, go and do things, get things super cheap off of eBay. It's not that much of an epitomant. Uh, I and mean, people spend more remodeling their bathrooms or kitchens, you know, than we did playing around, you know, with the, with these things. I, yeah. You needed a basement. You started in your parents' basement and, and you've moved out of the basement into, into your own lounge. Yes, <laughs> yes, lounge. exactly. So we just set up total freedom to do to do everything in that. It's like you hadn't grown up really at that point. Oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Never grow up. <laughs> still, 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 still working, I, I guess, with yeah. that side of it. So obviously, this this is a, the big thing, and, and and where you, I guess, we now come into kind of current times with the palm um, mm -hmm. side of things, and obviously that led more of your work then led to a Nobel Prize <laughs> through, mm. through that uh, stage. Uh, I've got some other images. So actually this, this is now. Oh yes, this is, um, we then connected up to Jennifer Lippincart Schwartz. And, you know, both of us, you know, I think Eric met her first. We both flew over to her lab, met on the airplane and because uh, he was living in Michigan, I was in uh, San Diego and she, amazingly enough, listened to us and said, okay, here's a dark room, here's a corner. 
and gave us some space to, to set up the thing. So it was winter time when we were doing this experiment. Um, George Patterson was there and he had provided the floor for us and we were working from before sunrise to after sunset in that little lab. And it was cold in there in the winter too. Uh, but, you know, we just persisted. And it now it looks like a basement. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, it was cold, <laughs> concrete floor. <laughs> and yeah, and that was that was the focus there for a while. But yeah. And these, but, the, 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 for anyone who hasn't seen a, a palm image. Uh, oh, yep, yeah. yeah. That was that was our very first, or I shouldn't say the very first, but among the first palm images. And, you know, and that's the one that we eventually, with a lot of fighting, you know, got into Science Magazine. Um, there, there's one interesting little story behind that picture. I really haven't told any, you know, many other people about it. But uh, I shared this photo, you know, with my, with my mother. And, you know, and she took a look, of, look at it. She was a medical technician sort of by, by training. And, you know, in Southern German language, you know, the Swabian, she said, this is a pista scheisse, which translated means uh, she wasn't very impressed by it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and then I asked her why, uh, you know, I said, oh, this is better than the resolution of microscope. So, but she was, you know, doing bacteriology in the lab sort of after World War II and a lot of people were dying with TB and one of the standards at the time was, uh, can you see TB? So, you know, I asked her why, why, why isn't this good? And she said, well, can you see TB with it? And TB are really tiny, very hard to see. And then I was thinking, well, can we somehow label these? And then she added, you know, can you see it in the sputum? And this is getting a little bit too real for me, but the, the one, Big story behind it really relates to where a lot of micros, um, microscopy comes from, because in the early 1900s, there's Robert Koch. He was the first person to really see individual TB bacteria, using at the time what was like the most advanced, you know, microscopes, you know, from Abbey where they really learned how to optimize it. You know, there was Zeiss microscopes at the time, and they learned the staining. You know, so that was tremendously relevant, you know, to society back then. So in a way it sort of sets, you know, this is cool, but, you know, from standards from a hundred years ago, you know, what they were seeing with the advances of my, microscopy were really a major impact. And I always think, well, okay, you know, really need to go, you know, what's, how far can you go with these? You know, so this, I think that's not the end. So, so obviously that that's with light. We will always be limited, I think, with what we can mm -hmm. achieve with light. But obviously you've now moved a lot into electron, coming back to the electrons again. Right, right. And bringing those together, which, which is a big area actually, uh, of a big emerging area. I, I don't think it's, I think we're still in a, Oh yeah, yeah. An innovator stage. Yeah, uh, yeah I feel that's right. I'm not, I feel tremendously lucky after that. Genelia came up too as a place to be. You know, this place back here has just came out of the mud about 15 years ago. And uh, you know, and there was just a confluence of ideas. You know, high throughput imaging from the semiconductor and hard disk drive was becoming relevant for biology. The electron microscopy was coming together the light microscopy and the super resolution. I mean, I, I was just sort of lucky that all of these factors that I just happened to, you know, pass through and touch on were just convening at the same time. So it just sort of made it, you know, natural to, you know, try to pull all of that together, get the electron microscopes going, try to do it together with the uh, you know, the best possible optical microscopy. I recycle some of the multi-phase interferometry from hard disk drives to biology applications. And so 
you know, so as, as far as the technology goes, I think a lot, a lot of things are coming together. But what are the challenges or what's the next steps for the electron microscopy side? Um, oh, gosh, I'm, there's sort of a, a big open area right now on trying to explore, I think, actually trying to combine two frontiers. One is larger and larger structures. I mean, biology structures are big. You know, you can see pieces of them nicely with the best high resolution microscopes, the TEMs, uh, but sometimes you don't get the whole ecosystem of a big piece of organ or organism or something like that. And at the other end, you can see large stuff with light microscopy, maybe it's somewhat better resolution with uh, a somewhat compromised form of electron microscopy, but trying to sort of bridge the two extremes and somewhat just pull out the maximal information is important. And they're also complementary. I mean, biology is so rich in the information content that it has in there. You know, there are thousands of different proteins. You know, you only get a hint of a small fraction of that with an electron microscope. Fluorescence also just sort of gives you just a, a fleeting glimpse of the richness that's in there. And so, so what does the electron microscope describe your idea, your dream electron microscope, or your actually your dream microscope? Oh, well, yeah, the dream is, I think you have to sort of parse it by what's the information content that comes out. So, it, you know, I'd like to sort of really develop this a little bit with the biological guidance at the same time, you know, so you don't face like a bankrupt kind of customer situation. Um, but it seems like the microscopes, they should be able to sort of see a combination of genetic expression, high resolution on the proteins, maybe protein confirmation. And the first place to ask is, you know, from the biological side, what are sort of the, the desires? And then you come back to the other side, the toolkit, you know, because people do what you know how to do. And, and then you try to see, okay, is there some space where you can try to encompass both of those? And I, I think they sort of align pretty much with what people are thinking about right now in terms of the challenges. I mean, getting genetic expression information out, getting protein labels, trying to see a protein confirmation state in a native environment is a big, um, you know, holy grail of the, right now for a lot of people. Um, and I always look a little bit to the edges of the field, you know, often this is Bell Labs, when it sort of comes in with this mind, there are all these people occupying spaces in the field and then you try to find the white space what's what's not touched on quite yet and and usually you find that sometimes by trying to get a little innovation on the on the microscopy side which might allow you to sort of go a little deeper in one dimension or another and and nowadays this is all so tied up with uh, analyzing the data we're right now in a world where you can't just look at an image and understand it anymore. Uh, I mean, it's, we're really going to see the world through the eyes of a computer going forward because it's, you know, they're terabits that describe an experiment and getting that through a two dimensional projection of the eye, you know, there's some massive distillation and we have to be very careful about what that distillation is. So it doesn't bias us in one way or the other. So I think there's, there's a, a big challenge in just trying to answer questions. You know, how, what, what do we want to see? What do we want to pull out? So it's, you know, it's it's a pretty rich area right now. It would be the, I, I guess, a lot of other guests have also commented. It's the data analysis. It's the machine learning, mm -hmm. uh, and to actually help us understand our data to right. a greater depth than we can visually extract. And the yeah. speed of that as well. Yeah. I, I also really like the fact 
that you brought back again the customer focus so actually mm -hmm. your customer now i guess is the biologist oh and yes the questions that need to be answered so you've been informed that they're now your customer base i guess and you are oh exactly working for them yeah, that sounds wrong but you know oh, it's, it's totally i mean that that's sort of the ultimate goal i mean in the end can one have some impact on society like robert Koch did in discovering tb i mean it used to be disease was everywhere and now because you can see it i mean that's i mean if you look back on the history microscopy has really done a lot for human society you know before you'd be looking at the uh you know, a rather crude description of, you know, the human body and, uh, you know, and what's wrong with it. Uh, I forgot, there, there's a name, the four, uh, uh, yeah, passes my head right now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of, the potential for a lot of impact, but, you know, I think biologists can say it, but sometimes, and we have to, of course, work with them to say, what can you from the physics side potentially dream about and explore and maybe make a case for it um and there's a long way to go i think uh you know when we look at electron microscopes you said you've got to look at the big picture but on, a, on an electron microscope scale anything we look at is tiny you know mm -hmm. it, 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 it's it, it's such a tiny representation of the, of the bigger picture that it doesn't it, it's it's useful but it's missing so much. And I think there may be detractors in the, in the field even that may say that actually, what is the point? Because actually, I think even Eric said you need the, the live side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, but yeah, you know, that's I, today. I think the future could be different. And, and as with many things, even if you go back now to your first electron microscope, that, that was uh, with a one megavolt, it, it was never... It, it never made it into the bio world, particularly. Right. But look how that field has moved and developed to solve. Oh, problems. tremendously. Yeah. Uh, uh, very much according to those original dreams. But you're right. The time dimension is important. It's all about just pulling out information. You know, maybe emphasis on the re resolution, maybe emphasis on the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but biology is just such a fun, rich system to think about. You mentioned time, and we've actually gone over one hour already. So, oh, no. I, I, <laughs> and I've got I've got more questions, but I, I, I okay. <laughs> I guess we'll have to shelve some of those questions. I would like to ask. So, I don't, so, so just because time time is quite short, what would you say your biggest weakness is, and what is your biggest strength? I think they go together a little bit. Um, it tend to be, I think, very responsive to, you know, do what other people want in the end, you know, and, you know, ended up going into directions like looking at fruit, which maybe didn't bear any fruit in the end, so to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, being very opening, open and listening, uh, you know, you just get a chance. I mean, I think I've been lucky just to have a a chance through all of these ups and downs, failures, unemployment and that, uh, I've had the opportunity to sort of explore a rich uh, combination of different fields and different ways of looking at it. Uh, and so I think that gives me a little perspective, which I think is, uh, you know, is, you know, is useful. And, 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 and also a set of experience and tools you know, by having passed through all these different areas, I think is useful. I mean, it didn't make for a, you know, super smooth, secure life or anything like that, but it, it uh, taking the risks, you know, for me at least, you know, worked out. You yes, know, very luck successful. And, distance. <laughs> and what, is, what, what is your pet hate? Ah, oh, pet hate. Um, I think sometimes I get a little bit annoyed by doing science sometimes for the sake of security or not going far enough. 
you know, it's like trying to do this for a next paper. I mean, sometimes I, I think people get wrapped up with a, a lot of parts of the biological culture, or I should say science culture, where there's certain expectations on publishing and talks and, you know, things like that, uh, which to me sometimes are a little bit at the odds of going your own way with a passion in your own direction, you know. So sometimes, you know, the nail that sticks up sort of gets hammered down. Yeah. And uh, I think having a little accommodation for that is good. I think the world really thrives by having different approaches, different ecosystems, uh, and trying to unify it too much is is good. I mean, you really need the sort of the diversity of approaches uh, that are out there. Okay. So yeah, so I think I'm. Yeah, I, I think the pet hate is sort of combined with the sort of the pet desire to have these, uh, you know, very diverse way approaches for trying to go after science and take very non-standard paths to get there. Uh, uh, well, you've exemplified that quite nicely <laughs> throughout your own career. Harold, we'll have to call it there because okay. I've been over. But thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a fascinating to hear about your track record throughout this. It's been quite amazing. And I think lots will find it quite inspiring. And to have the confidence to take a risk every now and then, because if you really want to succeed, I guess you have to follow your passions. That's exactly what you've done and brought them all together very nicely. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. And, and do you know what? You chime so much with uh, Jeff Lickman's work with the, the mm. big connectomics, which I know you're very, I was mm. going to say connected to, but that's really not the right way to, to word it. <laughs> for this. That's and right. obviously with Eric and Jennifer, just how much all these mm. very different people working on very different areas are actually come together to solve and, and to help. The customer oh yes 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 that's yeah it's been an absolute pleasure yeah to, Carol, to thank you very much thank you thank you so much thank you for listening to the microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by zeiss microscopy to view all audio and video recordings from this series please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists